Na początku chciałabym zaprosić Państwa do wysłuchania wystąpienia gościa specjalnego konferencji. Eben Mogle jest profesorem prawa na Uniwersytecie Columbia w Nowym Jorku, współtwórcą licencji GNU GPL, prezesem Software Freedom Law Center i założycielem Freedom Box Foundation. Wystąpienie odbędzie się w języku angielskim. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Eben Mogle. honor for me on my first visit to Warsaw in too long a life, never to have been here before, and this is the right time to begin. So thank you for the privilege that you are giving me. Our culture is born free, and everywhere it is in chains. Of course, it may not feel so very much chained up here in Warsaw. So I will ask you to join me for a moment in the street in Bangalore or Calcutta or Shunja or Cairo. I will ask you to join me in imagining yourself into the body of a 12-year-old girl who wants to learn and who, like almost every other human being in the history of the world, is having her brain starved to death. Her desire to know, to encounter our world, the world in which we live so comfortably, the world of Mozart and Newton and Gibbon, and Tolstoy, the world she wishes to inhabit, the world of our culture, is shut. And the way to it is closed. Because she began living from hand to mouth at three years old, when she went to work to earn her daily food, and never since that moment, when she first went to work at three years old, has she heard music, or read text, or seen beauty that wasn't snatched out of the corner of her eyes. As one such young girl wrote at 13 and a half, when a computer was given to her and free software so that she could write, she wrote, those of us who do not live in slums think that those who do are different. We are not different, we are the same. The difference is that we must go out to work at a very early age to earn our bread. And therefore we cannot go to school. But if we could go to school like other people, then the differences between us and them would be ameliorated to a great extent. She was writing her own language, Canada. She was not writing English, but that's the translation in that degree of simplicity and restraint. She wants knowledge the way our bodies want food and water, and the way is shut. Why is it shut? It used to be that the way to knowledge and to culture was shut because there were too many people and too few times and places and books from which to teach them. And so for the whole history of the human race, until now, we have starved brains to death because we had no choice. Faut de mieux, the human race attempted to educate some brains, and the rest died. But that was then, and this is now. We live at the beginning of the first moment in the history of the human race when ignorance is preventable. Later in your lifetime, the entire human race will be connected 
to one great nervous system external to the human body and we will be part of one single superorganism connecting every brain. Already, in most parts of the world, it is possible for the poorest of the poor to have mobile phones. Where that girl who's writing comes from, in Bangalore, in India, people who cannot afford two meals a day have a phone. And on that phone, we can put every book, every piece of music, every painting, every piece of sculpture, every map, every scientific experiment, every choreography, every, everything of beauty and utility in a digitized world can be given to anyone, anywhere, anytime who wants to learn, to expand her brain, to nourish her ability to see, to think, to understand, to make poetry, to make music, to make art. Every one of them, anytime, anywhere, no brain need star anymore. This generation, we can prevent ignorance. We can end cultural deprivation. One thing and only one thing stands between us and the end of ignorance. The only thing that stops us now is the rules against sharing. So let us understand where we are right now. Our culture is born free and everywhere it is in chains. The only thing that stops us from eliminating ignorance and from acknowledging the equal dignity and right to learn of every human mind is the rules against sharing. What's keeping us from freedom is the rules and the power that supports them. At this moment, I come here because here is the right place to come. Here, in this place, in this country, in this society, in this language, at the end of the 20th century, the ideas were expressed which explains what we should do at a time like this. We have thinned out the wall between us and justice. We have eliminated almost all the barricades between ourselves and what we know is right. We know, we know, in all our hearts, we know that it is wrong to starve a brain when we don't have to. Because it would be wrong to starve a human being in the presence of piles of food. It is wrong. We know it's wrong. Each of us, in our own sense of injustice, which each of us carries with us, we know that we are living in the presence of radical injustice. We know that we benefit from that injustice. If we want Beethoven, we don't even need to move our hand. If we want Tolstoy, we don't need to move our eyes. We carry all of our culture, thousands of years of human development, we carry literally in the palms of our hands. And we know that we are benefiting from injustice. We know this. And most of the time, of course, we prefer not to know what we know. Because life in an unfree society is about forgetting. I look around this room and I see so many people who learned this lesson with their bodies in their childhoods. And I see those people in this room, all of them at this moment, looking at the younger people in the room and thinking how lucky you are that you grew up in a society we had already changed enough that you didn't learn that lesson with your bodies in your childhood. 
Life in an unjust society is about forgetting. And so we look at Michelangelo, or we listen to the old Bach, or we read Czesław Miłosz, and we know that brains are starving as we eat. But life in an unjust society is about forgetting what we know about justice. And one of the things about globalization is that it makes it harder to forget. So now, what do we do? We live in an unjust society. We eat while others starve. We take for granted the superfluity of our food. We take for granted that we have everything. And we are enabled only temporarily to forget all those who have nothing. And so we discuss royalties. Royalties, we call them. We call them royalties because they are the sign of inequality, of injustice. We live in a republic and we discuss royalties because we forget injustice and we do math. What do you do when you live in a society of radical injustice? in which the people around you forget from moment to moment everything they really know deep in their bodies about it's all quite wrong. <coughs> what do you do? I learned in my childhood when I was a young person meaning to be a lawyer, when I was a young person thinking about how to grow up to make justice, I learned. I learned from Adam Meekman what you do. You live as though in freedom. You dare unfreedom to work its rules. You demand that the only thing there is between yourself and justice, which is the rules against fairness, you demand that they work. And because you demand that they work, they fail. Because you demand that they work, you break the system of forgetting. Because you demand that injustice exercise itself, that it come out of the space of forgetting where it lives, that it present itself live now, here, it fails. So, I invite you, for an instant, sitting in a seat in a theater where imagining is permitted. I advise you of the pleasure of imagining in the theater. And having advised you of the pleasure of imagining in the theater, I advise you also of the pain, the pity, and the dread of imagining in a theater. And I imagine, as maybe you will join me in imagining, that we in this theater have one tragic flaw, that we are poor. And from that tragic flaw grows our tragedy, which is the tragedy of hunger, the tragedy of desperation, the tragedy of ignorance that we can draw into our own bodies, through our own imagination, what it means to want everything we take for granted and never to have it. So now I must ask you, what does a free person do in that condition into which I have invited you to imagine yourself? What do you do when you want to learn and they won't teach you? because you can't afford to pay. Do you call it stealing when a hungry man feeds his hungry child? 
Do you call it stealing when a person dying of thirst drinks water when there's water everywhere? You call it freedom when the starving feed themselves. You call it freedom when those who thirst drink. You call it freedom when those who are ignorant demand to learn. And what does a free person do in the presence of that situation? We feed the hungry. We clothe the naked. We teach the ignorant. And if we have to, we whip the money lenders from the temple. Because that's justice in such a state. Of course, it's easy to do all those things because we're in a theater and all we need to do is to imagine them done and they are done. And in the real world, out there, in the street, where Einstein is starving for a chance to learn mathematics, where Shakespeare is starving for a chance to read poetry, out there, is it not so simple? Oh, it is just the same. We only need to imagine it done. And it is done. We must live as though culture were free. Because otherwise, we must participate in starving ourselves who happen to be poor. Oh, well, we can solve this problem without imagining free culture. Let's copy all the books on earth and put them in a place where everybody can read them for free. As long as they agree to be spied on while they're doing it. Let's agree that the poor can have all the books. But not the kind of books we have. The kind of books that report at headquarters who is reading them. The kind of books that record who is watching every page for how long. The kind of books that ask whether did you read page 49 before page 48 or only after page 512. The kind of books, in other words, that you can get at the KGB library of Mountain View, California. Let us assume, let us assume that the poor are only entitled to surveil the culture. We who got there first, we were entitled to the culture nobody surveilled. We were entitled to read books that didn't spy on who was reading them. We were entitled to music that didn't erase itself after we heard it. We were entitled to the source code of culture. They, they are entitled to the kind we give them because they are poor and they must take it the way we deal it to them. Or maybe we should just help them ourselves. Maybe we have to climb over the wall. Not going out, but going in. Maybe we need to climb over a wall into the space of unfreedom to demand that we get a chance to live unfree inside the wall. Maybe that's what it means to take what we have learned from your history. Maybe that's what it means for us to have learned the lesson that you so bravely taught the rest of the world. Back before you forgot about injustice. The ease with which we forget injustice is one of the saddest things about the human race. It's so easy for us to forget injustice. And so hard for us to remember courage when we have lost it. You need to say no. You need to say no. The time has come when the rules against sharing must disappear. The way tanks must sometimes disappear. And soldiers, and presently existing socialism, and other things that produce injustice. Because things are not what they are named. 
Things are not what they are called. Things are not what power tells you is the story of them. Friendship among peoples. International socialism. The freedom of the working people of the world. And it doesn't matter what it's called. It matters what it does. And what it does is injustice. What it does is gulag. What it does is the basement of the prison where they shoot you. But think how much stupider injustice was in the 20th century. How brutal. How silly. How clumsy. KGB never succeeded in convincing the inhabitants of its empire to wear devices everywhere they went that checked in at the right place. KGB never said, now in purple, now in orange, now thinner, better, brighter, wear our collar, please. Not for free. No, 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 no. Pay us to surveil you. Pay us to track you. Pay us to record you, spy on you, monitor you, turn you over to anybody we turn over for. Imagine if KGB had offered to charge people $1,000 to be monitored forever. And yet, you forgot injustice. And you bought an iPhone. You not only helped the rules against sharing to survive, you helped the rules against freedom to grow. Because culture does not behave as though free when it is built in a net whose purpose is to charge you, monitor you, keep track of you. In the end, you too get only the Bach you're willing to be listened to while listening. In the end, you too get only the books that report you as headquarters as you read them. How could people in this city, of all cities on the earth, how could people in this city be carrying little objects that allow them to read books, recording at Amazon what they are reading as they are? How could you do that? Because you have learned a new trick. You have learned how to live in a free society as though unfree people. And the people who taught you that charged you for it. And you pay them every day. Therefore, we must learn to say no. Therefore, we must learn to insist that the culture that is free to us be free to all. Therefore, we must insist that the dignity of every human mind is the same and that the right of every human mind to learn, to understand, to appreciate, to enjoy beauty and to make beauty and to change beauty and to share beauty is the same. And once we have declared that, then we will have to live by what we have declared. As though free in a world of unfreedom, we will have to go over the wall, not outward, not in escape, not to get away, but to go in. Because it is only when one man climbs over the wall that unfreedom begins to disappear. <clears throat> I am not telling you something I made up. I am telling you something you made up. I came here to this theater to remind you of the play that you performed. I came here to this theater to remind you of the life you made for me. But the next act, the next act belongs to all of us. How many of the Einsteins, whoever lived, were allowed to learn physics? And how many of the Shakespeare's, whoever lived, were allowed to learn to read and to write. So there are seven million people in the world right now. More than three and a half billion of them are children. How many Einsteins do you want to throw away today? 
How many Shakespeare should the human race lose because the poor cannot buy culture at its cost? How many people shall we allow to be tortured for what they think that their iPhone turned them in for? How many people's reading will we allow to be monitored by the forces of unfreedom? It's up to us completely. It's up to us completely. If you decide to say no, the system will fall. If you decide to say no, the system will crumble. I don't need to explain to you that that has nothing to do with how many tanks it had. Joseph Stalin wanted to know how many divisions has the Pope. I do not care how many divisions has Hollywood. It matters not a bit. <coughs> if you say no, the situation changes. The walls fall. What should no sound like? Should it sound like copyright reform? Should it sound like more fair use? Should it sound like the right to share with our friends in the net? Well, if it has to, it has to. If that's the only way to say no, then say it that way. But better would be simpler. Better would be, we are a part of solidarity. And we say no. The solidarity we're part of is the solidarity of human race the solidarity of human culture. We're all in the same network. We all have the same phone numbers. We all live in the same world. We are in solidarity and we say no. We won't eat while others starve. We won't teach our children while other children go ignorant. We won't starve every poor brain on earth because we don't happen to be poor. No. We're in solidarity and we say no. We are the community of the human race and we say no. Don't say copyright reform, say no. Don't say more sharing, say no. Don't say fair use say no injustice. We are in solidarity with the human race and we say no. You will be told that at that point there will be nothing. You will be told that at that point music will cease. Art will stop happening. <coughs> Poetry will vanish. This is a goddamned lie. There is no polite way to explain what this is. Because, of course, all this property was born yesterday. Johann Sebastian Bach thought that all music was made by God. He would be very surprised that there is a man in the United States named Rupert Murdoch who thinks he owns some music. There was music before there was intellectual property. There was art before there was intellectual property. There was philosophy before there was intellectual property. There was the culture we depend upon before injustice moved in on us. What would have been the history of Poland, let alone the West, if every book had for the last 500 years reported its readers at headquarters? <coughs> What would be the fate of this world we love together, this Warsaw outside us? What would be the fate of it if every painting had watched who watched it? If every photograph had spied on every eye? If every book had recorded every reader? Could you be free at all? Could you enjoy even the littlest bit of what you now have? I think that we all probably imagine the same thing. If every book and every piece of music had been recording every listener and every reader for the last 500 years, you would be slaves. And I, like every other one of my relatives who lived in Europe at the opening of 1940,
would not exist. So we had better make up our minds to say no now. Not only for ourselves, but for the future. We had better make our minds up to say no now before we create an unfreedom for our progeny that our ancestors were willing to die not to hand on to us. We had better recognize that when we forget injustice, we destroy the future. And we had better keep in mind that through no fault of their own, they were simply badly educated. We live among many people who would prefer to be rich now than to hand justice to the future. You know them. You see them around you every day. I don't want to do anything to them. I just want to say no, which is our right as the human race. It is our right. So what I came here to say is said. And I must ask you to imagine that you heard me. I must ask you to imagine just for one more moment while we're in this theater, before the illusion of freedom dissolves, and we go back out into whatever it is that is out there, I must ask you to imagine for a moment that you heard me, not with your ears, but with your hearts. Imagine for a moment that you actually heard inside your heart the cry of the injustice you would feel if you were too poor to learn. I came here too late in my life to meet one man in Warsaw whom I had spent my life wanting to meet, and many of you were lucky enough to know, a man called Madagin. I didn't want to meet him because I thought he was a nice man. I didn't want to meet him because I thought that he was a just man. I wanted to meet him because he was a man who knew how to say no. But that's all right. I may have missed him.